Today we'll be discussing our final world region, which is East Asia. And as you can see from the satellite image here on the slide, this is a very large region. And we'll discuss the countries that fall within this region. But our dominant country here is China, along with Japan. So what are the subregions of East Asia? This includes, as I said before, Japan, China, Mongolia and Taiwan, and the Kyrias. And we'll discuss each region in more detail. So as always, I'm going to start with the physical geography and then talk about the people of East Asia. And due to uh, PowerPoint's recording platform, all of my videos that I would normally show, uh, the links will be included in the module on Canvas. So China, Mongolia, North Korea, South Korea, and Japan, and Taiwan. Ta-da! These are all the countries in East Asia. All right, what does the climate look like in East Asia? Well, remember that this is a, again, a very large land area. So it's taking up many degrees of latitude. So as you're looking at the south part of East Asia, which includes China, that climate type will be humid subtropical. And that is probably fairly obvious. You know, we're adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. Warm, moist air is coming into the region. Uh, if you move further to the north, where we're in the interior of the east of the Eurasian continent, you'll see a arid or semi-arid region. Mongolia is primarily part of that. In our Tibetan plateau is a very high area. We're going to discuss that in more detail in just a minute. In northern China and in the Koreas, it's primarily continental mid-latitude. So remember, continental mid-latitude, we have very hot summers and very cold winters, so we have a lot of temperature variation. And my graphic doesn't want to load. All right, so let's talk about the physiographic regions of East Asia. So there's two really physiographic regions here. One we call humid China or inner China, and the other is outer China or arid China. And when you do your map reading activity on Canvas this week, you will be looking at population distribution throughout this region. But knowing that arid China or outer China is rather sparsely populated, and that is because of the temperature extremes that we find here. So arid China or outer China is divided into two subregions, two sub physiographic regions, including again, the Tibetan plateau, as well as the central mountains and plateaus. And a couple other things to point out, the Yellow River is also here. That's one of our major rivers for this region, as well as Uganzi's River, um, the Three Gorges Dam. And I'll point all those out again as we discuss them, but I just wanna point them out now. The Lost Plateau is also in this region. Um, a series of drainage basins here in our central mountains and plateaus. Um, and then, as I said before, the Tibetan plateau. So let's discuss these in more detail. In the Tibetan plateau, that is that area there that is in the blue. Um, again, this uh, map is in your textbook, so if you want to look at that in more detail, uh, that's where you will find that. So what is the important mountain range here? You should know this one. Correct, the Himalayan mountains. These are the world's highest mountains. And you can actually see that featured on the map here. That is where we find Mount Everest. And our second highest mountain, which is what? Does anyone know? Correct, that is K2. And K2 is found in which mountain range? That's right, in the Karakoram Mountains. Oops. 
there it is, Mount Everest, as I said before, um, world's tallest mountain above ground. So there actually is a larger mountain um, that is partially submerged that is in Hawaii. So let's talk a little more in detail about life in the Tibetan Plateau. I think I've mentioned this previously when we talked about South Asia, but remember that the Eurasian plate very long in the Earth's past crashed against, or I should say the Indian plate crashed against the Eurasian plate. When it did that, it lifted up part of the Earth's crust. So the Tibetan Plateau is that piece of lifted crust. And as I said before, it is a massive, M-A-S-S-I-F. And that is again, a lifted piece of the Earth's crust. So it's a very large land area. As it says on the slide, 2.5 million square kilometers. Let's just have a quick video about life in the Tibetan Plateau. This is midsummer on the Tibetan Plateau, the highest great plain in the world. Despite the conditions, grass survives and in sufficient quantities to support the highest of all grazing herds, those of the wild yak. Even in summer, life is hard. Temperatures rarely rise above freezing and the air is thin. It's also exceptionally dry for one very big region. The Himalayas. The great mountain range acts as a barrier, preventing clouds moving in from the south, and this casts a giant rain shadow that leaves Tibet high and dry. to life even as desiccating winds remove what little moisture remains in the soil. So long as grass can survive, so can grazers. Wild ass. The males are fighting to win territories. Those that hold the best are more likely to attract a herd of females. It's a frisky business. That counts as a victory, but he can't assume the females will actually turn up. Female asses are mysterious creatures. They come and go as they please, and much of their behavior seems unfathomable to an outsider. <laughs> They're the great nomads of the plateau and will often trek vast distances across these parched plains in search of oases. But when they do find paradise, they are liable to feed and drink for just a few hours and then head back to the dust for no apparent reason. So as you can see, it's a relatively wild area. There's not much in the way of protection, actually. I mean, because it's such a wind swept plateau, there's not very many trees that grow in the plateau. Um, so as you might imagine, life in that region, pretty difficult. 
So again, what type of subsistence would they be practicing? Transhumanants. So following herd animals with the seasons. And this is actually one of the nomadic herders that are found in the Tibetan Plateau. So they'll also in this area shift based on elevation. Obviously in the higher elevations in the winter, it will be very cold. So they might shift to the lower elevations to get a little bit more warmth. So what is the, as I said before, the important animal of this region? The yak. And as I mentioned before, yak butter tea, highly important to the people who live in this region. Because it's so high, they need to have extra calories just to keep their body warm. So they'll make butter out of yak's milk and then put it in the tea, which they then consume. From everything I've heard, it is not a delicious drink, but you know, you gotta keep yourself warm. And this is their traditional structure that they live in. It is a yird. So it is a lattice structure on the inside. So it's a collapsible tent. And if you remember when we were discussing the peoples of Central Asia and the Russian Federation, our nomadic peoples that lived in this region had similar structures. So here we have come all the way around the world and you can see where those cultures intersect. As I've made that point many times before, no region exists in isolation. These things all occur with cultural sharing and ideas mixing and language mixing. And so now we're starting to see the effects of that, right? So again, a yurd, their lattice structure tent, which is portable. Okay, so that was a Tibetan plateau. Let's talk about the central mountains and plateaus. This includes both China and Mongolia. You can see that there. So our elevations here are going to be lower than we find on the uh, Tibetan Plateau, which is a pretty high region. Um, as you can see on the slide, 1,000 to 2,000 meters in elevation. Also in this area, we find the Loss Plateau. So that's how you pronounce that word, L-O-E-S-S, -S, Loss Plateau. And what is loss? So that is actually a geologic term. And what that means is fine wind-blown sediment. So it is fine sand that has been eroded actually from our Tibetan plateau and from the Himalayan mountains and landed there in that plateau. So there that is on the map, make it easier for you to find. So also in our central mountain areas, we have deserts. So the Gobi Desert, here we are in the Gobi Desert, right? So that's that there. And the temperature extremes are so high in the Gobi Desert. So in the day, it will be warm-ish. And at night, it can be extremely cold. It is also a cold desert. You do get snow in the Gobi Desert. So again, such extremes in temperature that what will actually happen to the rock, if you can see in that image, on the top part of the slide, the rock will actually start to peel off in layers because of those constant changes from a really high temperature to a really low temperature. Obviously that's in the summer. And then in the winter, um, there could be snowfall that gets into the cracks of the rock and then it cracks um, as it approaches summer. And so the rock layers will actually flake and peel away just as if they were like your skin after a sunburn. So here is a video about the Gobi Desert. Not all deserts are hot. 50 mile an hour winds blowing in from Siberia bring snow to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia.
From a summer high of 50 degrees centigrade, the temperature in midwinter can drop to minus 40, making this one of the harshest deserts of all. Few animals can survive these extreme changes. Wild Bactrian camels, one of the rarest mammals on the planet, and perhaps the hardiest. Their biggest problem is the lack of water, particularly now in winter, when the little there is is locked up as ice. Surprisingly, snow here never melts. The air is just too cold and too dry for it to do so. The sun's rays turn it straight into vapor. It evaporates. But it is the only source of water so Bactrian camels eat it. Elsewhere in the world, a camel at a water hole can drink as much as 200 litres during a single visit. Here, the strategy is to take little and often, and with good reason, for filling the stomach with snow could be fatal. So yeah, as you can see, cold in the Gobi Desert, there's actually snow, but it doesn't melt and have runoff like we see in uh, other mountain areas or other areas where you're going to get heavy snowfall. Instead, it just evaporates because it's so dry. And again, the Gobi Desert and that whole region is in the interior of the massive Eurasian continent. So you're going to have a lot of dryness here. We're not going to get a lot of rainfall. And then finally, we reach our... Uh, last physiographic region which is inner china or humid china also known as the continental margin and if you're looking at our cities you can see that the bulk of our large cities occur in this region so again as you're doing that map reading activity for this week realizing that actually again most of our population lives in inner china or humid china or also known as the continental margin and in our continental margin we find a variety of landforms such as plains areas, hills, the continental shelf, which extends out into the East China Sea, into the South China Sea, as well as our island regions. So when we talk about elevation, this area is much lower. We're sloping downward off of those mountain areas down towards the water. So it's a low area, about 200 meters. So in our continental mar margin, again, we do find mountains. Here we have Mount Fuji, probably the one that everyone is most familiar with because it is on all the postcards. So this is in Japan, it is an active volcano. And again, we are on the uh, ring of fire. So there is active volcanic activity occurring in this region. Mount Fuji is active. And there you go. So here in our map, we are looking at an image of Japan. We are at the boundary of several plates so uh, if you can see that on the map where the kind of pinky purple line is, that's where we have the possibility of tsunamis. Tsunami is a Japanese word. It means harbor wave. So all of those massive waves coming from uh, Japanese culture, that name. And as you can see, again, on the map, those red dots representing earthquake epicenters and the orange dots are major volcanic eruptions. And in the upper chart tells us about are earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. So uh, very high on the Richter scale, for example, in 1933, we had an 8.5 uh, earthquake, right? So it's pretty darn bad. <laughs> um, where it says Mount is where we're looking at our volcanic eruptions. And this is an archipelago. So remember, archipelagos are chains of islands, and they are found on plate boundaries. As you can see in the map, we are, again, at the junction of several plates, which means we have the possibility of island chains forming. 
and as I said, part of the Ring of Fire. So this is where we have the junction of the Eurasian plate, the Pacific plate, and the uh, Philippines plate, right there. So again, we have volcanoes, earthquakes, um, and just knowing that overall, this area is geologically unstable. So if you were to be asked a question like that on your knowledge check, hint, hint, yes, this entire region is geologically unstable, including part of China. There are faults that are running throughout the region. Okay, so let's talk about the river system. So this is the Uganzes River. It begins in western China, so really in our areas, of course, of higher elevation and then flowing of, to the ocean. One of our major rivers. The other is the Yellow River. So the color of this river, although it's called the Yellow River, which looks more brown to me, but the reason that they call it the Yellow River is because it has a lot of silt in it. And again, that lost soil, that's from the Lost Plateau, it is... Uh, blowing into the water and giving it that color. And remember when we discussed flooding at our major rivers, when you have a lot of sediment in the water, that means when it does break the banks, when we have flooding, it is a major geologic hazard. It's not just the wall of water, you also have all of that heavy dirt. So when that hits a village, it's going to wipe all the buildings out. And this river actually is one of those areas where we have seen that happen multiple times. Because it's going through at least partially through the Lost Plateau, it is on really shifty soil. So our Lost Soils, as it says on the slide, are extremely fine, which means they're susceptible to erosion. They're also, they will also shift a lot. So that means the Yellow River has actually shifted quite a bit. In fact, we know that has shifted about 20 times in recorded history, which is a lot for a river. Most of them shift maybe a couple times. This one shifted 20 times in recorded history. So, um, there's also been many times where the river has, again, flooded and caused major loss of life. So then that has led to, you know, trying to protect people from flooding. And one of those projects that was put in place to do that was the Three Gorges Dam, and that's on the Uganzes River, so not on the Yellow River, um, on the Uganzes River. So as it said on the last slide, the Uganzes River is the world's third largest river, after which two rivers? Yes, the Amazon and the Nile. So the Nile is the longest river in the world. The Amazon is the largest by volume. The Congo is the second by volume. So when we say this is the third largest, it's also by um, length. All right, so our Three Gorges Dam, why did we start to build it? So. The area where our Three Gorges Dam is, is basically in the kind of unpopulated area of China. I mean, there's people living there, but it's not a heavy population and we needed to get electricity out there. So this project was designed to basically capture hydroelectric power. It's a large river. We can capture that power that the river is generating to power our homes. So this is one of the largest public works ever undertaken, as it says up there, $24 billion over a 14 year time span. So from 1994 to 2008, this thing was under work. So by 2011, the dam was fully operational, as you can see. So on the scale of this thing, this was comparable to the building of the Great Wall of China. As you can see on the slide, um, 26 million tons of slab concrete. Um, actually, in the construction of the wall, it ended up take, making a global deficit of concrete because they took so much, or of the dam, excuse me, took so much concrete to build the dam that it had a global deficit of concrete. The dam is 60 stories high and two kilometers long. So as it says up there, it is comparable to the building of the Great Wall of China, massive public works. 
the amount of steel and concrete in the dam is equal to the steel and concrete of 63 Eiffel Towers. And there you go, global concrete definition. So what were the positive aspects of our Three Gorges Dam? Well, the Three Gorges Dam, as I said before, generates a lot of electricity. As it says here, it actually powers 26 giant generators, which bring electricity to those rural households that are in that province, which is the Szechuan province, quite far out from our major cities. So this was a really big boon to those rural households, as well as giving them the option to enlarge their industrial development. And this was at a time when China's economy was really expanding. We'll talk about that more when we talk about the people of um, East Asia. But yeah, it was able to give them that um, option. And hydropower, well, it's a really beneficial you know, renewable resource. So it's more efficient, it's cleaner. Their other option is primarily coal use, so burning coal. And despite what you might have heard, um, it is not a clean option. So hydropower is, more, is both more efficient and cleaner than their current power usage. As I said before, the three, or the, excuse me, the Yuganzi's River, as well as the, um, Yellow River, both prone to flooding. Uganzi's River, as a, just like our Yellow River, uh, had killed, as it says on the slide, more than 300,000 people in the past 100 years. So this was with a good intention of trying to prevent major flooding. Well, what are the cons of the dam? It is unlikely that it would prevent the most disastrous floods as, again, these are major walls of water. Um, they are gonna carry a lot of settlement, uh, excuse me, sediment. So when they do, it could take down even probably parts of the dam. And, and then in terms of the construction of the dam, there was actually quite a bit of corruption, unfortunately. So, you know, cutting corners, so not really always the most safe in terms of construction. Um, and when you have, you know, friends that get involved in the project, maybe you're not always worrying about safety concerns, which as it says up there, um, there was over a hundred instances of corruption bribes um, to giving the jobs to people who are unequal to the task, which meant that the workers were actually in jeopardy. And as I also said, this area is geologically unstable. So this area is on top of an active fault line. So the dam itself is on an active fault line. So geologists are concerned that with the weight of the heavy sediment that's in the area, um, it would actually trigger an earthquake. So far that has been proven to be untrue, but geologic things proceed in their own time. So that doesn't mean that it might not happen. It just means that it hasn't happened yet. Um, and as I said before, it is also a high sediment area. So what happens behind the dam is that it builds up and then blocks the flood of um, dirt that would be normally just carried along, right? Um, and then also cause flooding upstream and major impacts to our upstream ecosystems systems, as well as our settlements. So what are some of the species that are impacted by the dam? That includes the habitat threat to our Chinese alligators. And I know like alligators, they're ugly, but there's a couple things with alligators. Number one, we only find alligators in two areas of the world. That is in China and Florida. Number two, they are a keystone species, which means when you take out our top chain predators like alligators, you're going to disrupt the entire ecosystem. And they're also indicators of what is going on in the ecosystem. So while alligators are not cute, 
they're useful, we need them. And so by getting rid of them, we're gonna cause a lot of ecosystem problems. So what they've actually seen is the um, increase in like pests, like rats, which our alligators might eat. And then other cuter animals like our white crane, our river dolphin and less cute Chinese sturgeon, all of those animals also impacted by the construction of the dam. So not only was the ecosystem impacted by this, but also the people. So in order to construct the dam, they ended up actually having to submerge a large land area, which would be on the other side of the dam where the water was stopped. If you can see it in this image, you can kind of see that there's water being built up. And when you do that, when you build that dam, it holds the water back. So now the water is being held in these areas that were once towns. So as it says on the slide, it ended up submerging then 19 cities, 150 towns, and 45,000 villages. It was in an area, as I said, a rural area where we had a lot of villagers. So while it was providing electricity to that area, it wasn't necessarily helping the villagers. So this is an area that was emptied for flooding, but this is a different river, not the Ugandese. And what ended up happening then is the people were forced into resettlement. So they were often forced into less fertile lands. You know, people in China live a little bit differently than we might have here, or maybe how we would have lived in the past, where they farmed a particular area, their family had done that for generations. So when they're forced to move to a different area, it was a huge upheaval. So the government, because it was a communistic government, gave them money to move, but they were forced to resettle. And they might not have considered that, hey, this had been their home for generations and or what was the productivity of the land that they forced them on. So as you can see on the slide, sometimes they were forced into lands that were less fertile or simply just in a different environment than they were used to doing it. This is rice paddies. So if you were used to farming rice, um, if the Three Gorges Dam area is in the south where it would in humid subtropical. So heavy rainfall in the summers, good for rice. So if they're forced to the north where it might be a little bit drier, they're not going to know how to farm in that area because that's not the environment they're used to. Um, so they're not farming rice anymore. Maybe they're farming something else or again, simply just not as productive. That led to a lot of social unrest. There was a lot of protests over the forced removal of these individuals. So at one point, the World Bank, which is the IMF, was involved in the project. After a while, they withdrew from the project because there were so many negatives, especially the corruption. So instead, private firms financed the dam, including the United States, because it was in our best interest for them to increase their industrial development. Where does all our stuff come from nowadays? That's right, China. So we wanted them to you know, increase their industrial output. Okay, so that is the physical geography of East Asia. So if you want to take a break, you can stop here. And then we'll go on and talk about the people of East Asia. So let's discuss some of the people of East Asia and the history. So in the past, obviously, most of the people who lived here were hunter gatherers. But China was one of the areas that first saw the agricultural revolution, meaning that the people shifted to agriculture. And actually China and the cultures of China are known as um, master innovators in terms of agricultural development. So for the past 8,000 years, they have worked the land meaning that they constructed the terraces, as you see in the images. And that was really, again, for water control. So actually the Chinese were masters of water control. They were also renowned, as I said before, for domestication. So the domestication of both plants and animals. So really they were leading the charge. And we often think about you know, Mesopotamia as the cradle of civilization, but China was actually doing those things at the same time or possibly even earlier than the cultures that settled in Mesopotamia. And one of the things that they did was built the Great Wall of China. 
So why did they do this? Well, they built the wall first to protect China from barbar barbaric nomads, and those were the Mongolians. So at the time, they were uh, several smaller empires, and then at that um, point, they decided to unite in one kingdom under the Qin Dynasty, which is Q I N, Qin Dynasty. And when they do that, again, this dynasty decides to build the wall. And the reason that they're doing it is to provide protection against Mongolian invasion. Obviously, as you might imagine, this was a massive endeavor that actually didn't happen in one time period. This actually cut across many of the different time periods. So we think of the Great Wall of China as a single wall. It is actually not. It's actually built in several pieces. Um, and I do have a video for the Great Wall of China. So please do go to Canvas to watch that video. As I've noted before, um, the videos don't work when I'm doing the screen recording. So um, you'll have to watch those separately. Some of them I have built into the lecture, some I don't. So go to the canvas to watch that one. All right, so we built the Great Wall of China. That was, a, again, an endeavor that cut across many different dynasties. And you can see that here in the map. Okay, so there's our Qin dynasty. That is the initial dynasty that unites China as one empire. All right, uh, and they're the ones that started the building of the Great Wall of China. And what happens then from there is the emergence of several other dynasties. And typically the dynasty is not hereditary, although it could be, but often a shift of power. So during this time, China developed numerous different things. Again, they're one of the masters of domestication and water control. They also developed weaponry like gunpowder. The bow and arrow also came from China. They also constructed both canals and walled cities. So canals for the movement of water, such as for irrigation, as well as walled cities for protection. So the Great Wall is just one example of that, but a lot of their cities were walled. So that concept comes from China. And as I've mentioned several times before, they really were the controllers of the Silk Road. So not at first, but over time, they controlled the Silk Road. In fact, as I said before, the Silk Road became known as the Silk Road because of silks that were coming out of China and India. On the Silk Road, we were not trading just goods, but ideas, languages, and religions. And China was really one of the benefit benefiters of that. So at the time of the height of the Silk Road, China was in charge of the global economy for that reason. And then over time, as we'll see, it starts to decline because of the, some of the decisions they made culturally. So we see um, dynastic shifting, right, amongst our uh, empires in China. So that they take over more and more territory as you're looking at in the map. So by 1850, with the Qing Dynasty, they have taken over much of the area that becomes known as China, Mongolia, Tibet, and then parts of um, Southeast Asia, as you can see in the tan color in the map. And so what happened with our shifting dynasties is that, again, sometimes it was hereditary, sometimes it wasn't, but a lot of times uh, one empire, emperor would be overthrown by another. Right, so it was actually a, a battle that allowed them to take power, and then the center of power would shift to wherever that new emperor's home would be. So rather than having one base that stayed the same the whole time, it shifted kind of all over the place. Japan borrowed a lot of the ideas from China, but then they took it a step further and closed their borders to outside influence. So they did trade with China, and the Koreas and you know other very local cultures, but nobody else. And so what that did was, unfortunately for them, kind of lead to a little bit of a stagnation in terms of both economics and actually defense, which will have implications for them as we'll talk about in a minute. But as part of this system, they developed a real pronounced social hierarchy. So at the very top, we have the shogunate, or the shogun, 
right? And at the bottom, of course, we'd have our farmers and artisans, you know, your workers. Samurais then were warriors that defended the shogun. So over time, so we're getting close to like the 1850s, in both China and Japan, we saw an imperial decline. Just as we have seen in other cultures around the world, they had a centralized power, right, which was their um, dynastic system, but that was a system that depended on the peasant class maintaining the elite, and they really were not doing much to take care of the peasant class. So when they were working on their country, if they did at all, they did not concentrate on their economics infrastructure, which in turn meant that the peasants had to pay more and more taxes, which they could not afford. So what this led to was revolt. Now remember, both in Japan and China, they actually had a lot of advances in weaponry. So our peasant class had access to weapons. So they turned to banditry where they were basically like kind of Robin Hood-ish where they would rob wealthy people that would be passing through the area. And what that meant then was then the elite restricted the development of new weapons. This was going to have huge implications for their culture because now they were not going to have the same type of weapons that they would encounter when other cultures would come to their shores. So China and Japan both kind of keeping to themselves at this point, again, going to have major implications for the future. Why did they restrict the development of new weapons? Well, because they did not want peasants to have control of the weapons because they didn't want them robbing the rich people. So they don't want them to get in their hands. As a result, our East Asian area fell behind the rest of Europe. So as I said before, that was going to have a big set of implications for uh, China and Japan. And this was in terms of weapons design, because it says before they were not allowed to design any new weapons, as well as in construction. They were not focusing on new development. So as I said on the previous slide, they were not focusing on infrastructure. They were not focusing on economics. So things were not going to be good, and it was setting the stage for what comes next. So what were they really behind? It was in the Industrial Revolution. So remember, the Industrial Revolution starts in the late 1700s in Europe, and continuing into you know the 1800s, eventually that makes its way over in the United States, et cetera, et cetera, but is not coming to the East Asian area. So while Europe had the ability to do mass production of items, China and Japan did not because they did not focus on the development of that. So when Europeans decided they were going to come into China and Japan, they had the advantage because they had the development of these new items. So let's talk now about Japan. So remember, Japan was a closed society. They did not open their borders to trade with any other cultures, I mean, minimally with Taiwan, the Koreas, China, but primarily not. Um, they did allow a little bit of trade with the Dutch. As I said before, the Dutch did not force themselves on other cultures in the ways that, for example, Britain did. Um, they didn't force other cultures necessarily to change their language or their religion. So they did allow a little bit of trade with the Dutch. If you've ever seen the movie Shogun, not the new one with Tom Cruise, but the better one with Richard Chamberlain, which is a much older movie, he is Dutch. So that uh, movie is, kind of shows that time period. But in 1853, the United States has decided Japan is going to trade with us whether we like it or whether they like it or not. So he brings his flagship into Edo, which eventually becomes known as Tokyo Bay, and quote unquote persuades the Japanese to open their ports to trade with the United States and other foreign powers. As you can see in the image, that persuasion involved firepower. 
Well, because the Japanese had not allowed for new weapons construction or new weapons design, their weapons just were not good enough to stand up against the ones from the United States. So they decided, uh, okay, we're just going to um, let this go. <laughs> okay, fine, we'll, we'll trade with you. But again, this will have major implications for what happens with the United States and Japan later on. This sets us on the course that eventually leads to the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. In China, we had something called the Opium Wars. So the Opium Wars lasted from 1839 to 1842. As we looked at when we talked about Southeast Asia, this area was one of the centers for opium production. Unfortunately, who were the ones who were really taking the opium were the elites. So China bans opium in the effort to try and stop the drug trade. Meanwhile, the British want to trade with China. The Chinese want gold and silver in exchange for things like silks and especially tea. So they decide instead of gold and silver that they're going to trade for that, they're going to trade opium. So they're privately trading opium at first against the orders of the Chinese government. And the Chinese government says, you're not going to do that. So in the battle uh, to gain control, the British sail into Chinese waters with a cargo ship filled with opium and the Chinese attack the ship. This is probably a pretty devilishly clever way of getting uh, control of the area because the British would then consider that an act of warfare and go to war with China. And again, the Chinese were not allowing the development of new weapons, so the British win pretty quickly. And that then leads to the Treaty of Nanking. So what did that say? The Treaty of Nanking said that we were going to give control of the island of Hong Kong to the British, which is that right there if you're looking at that on the map. So in 1860, they expanded the colony to include new areas, and in 1890 or 19, 1898, included even more new territories, which gave Britain a 99-year lease. Um, you can actually see that on the uh, map in the lower right. What that led to is Hong Kong being very different than the rest of China. So while China was overall a communistic area for a very long time, Hong Kong was capitalistic because it was under the control of the British. So actually a good number of the Chinese factory owners had placed their factories in Hong Kong because it was controlled by the British. So it was capitalistic. They could do what they wanted versus being in the mainland, which was communistic. In 1997, Hong Kong went back to the control of the Chinese. And that meant actually at that time that China became state capitalist, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So they started moving factories um, onto the So the Treaty of Nanking also allowed European and American traders access to the Chinese markets through treaty ports. And also meant now we won't have to pay them gold and silver for their tea and silk. We can give you other less valuable items. So that's kind of what the cityscape of Hong Kong ended up looking like, right? Again, because it had been a capitalist economy, it had been under British control, it ended up looking more modern, more European versus the rest of China at that time. China has, of course, very much changed since that time period, but um, by, you know, prior to 1997, it looked a lot different. Um, as you can see, uh, also very similar to what we see in Macau, which was under, I believe, Portugal. So there's some of the streets. You can see, again, that very Western influence, um, obviously a lot of billboards, very different than the rest of China. Again, at that time, um, nowadays, it look, you know, more of China looks like this. OK, so we, we're going to talk about China first. Um, we had our imperial period where we had our dynasties that were shifting, um, centralized government, uh, that 
dynasty falls as a result of some of their own actions, which was not taking care of the peasant class, as well as then being forced to participate in the world economic system by the British and the United States. So what happens after that? Well, our government then is shifting from being imperial control to eventually what becomes communistic control and becomes the Chinese Republic. So first we see the emergence of the Nationalist Party, which is capitalistic, right? Um, but he, they are not successful. So this is about a 20 year period where it was capitalistic under nationalist party again which is a capitalist system and they lose control for the communist party in china which is under the direction of mao zedong so taiwan is where our nationalists fled because that was under u.s protection remember united states does not like communism so we wanted to prevent all of the countries from this area from becoming communistic the United States kind of control Taiwan. So the Nationalist Party and all of their supporters flee to Taiwan. So that's why Taiwan looks a little bit different again than some of our other East Asian areas. It looks pretty modern. This leads to a good bit of tension as you might imagine between Taiwan and China. Um, and again, as this is the emergence of a communist party, China stays communist for a very long time. However, in 1976, Mao dies. And this leads to a power vacuum, right? So communism, not super popular. As we've seen in, maybe when we talked about Russia, if you can remember that, people were forced to do things they didn't wanna do. They were forced to move to places they didn't wanna move. They didn't always have access to clean food or water. Um, you know, not a warm and fuzzy economic system. And honestly, in many times when we've seen communist rule in a country, it is very unsuccessful. It might be successful initially because you have centralized control, but whether or not they want to acknowledge that, they often have a good bit of corruption. And it's really more under the control of a couple elites that have nothing on, of the concern of the people in mind. Well, in any case, as it says on the slide, communism not popular, especially in 1976, when more of the ideas of democracy had spread to China. So they were able to see that a little bit more. Um, if you remember that uh, this is around the time of the end of the Vietnamese War, the Vietnam War. So communism really just is struggling at this point and the people of China do not want it. The government promotes communism. They have the full support of the Communist Party and people were protesting that. Um, although I've heard some stories about this particular image that the tanks did not hit this individual. He actually then just walks off. Okay, so there's that transition period, which is a little bit, not necessarily well, okay, it was violent, um, but eventually what that leads to post Mayao is to what we call state capitalism. So kind of what we might call big government here in the United States. So a lot of government subsidies, government is still very involved in the running of the country, um, but there's more privatization. And what that also leads to then is sweatshops, right? So more of our work is shifting into the interior of China uh, versus just being concentrated on Hong Kong. Although, as you can see on our map here, many of our economic zones are along the coastline. So um, this was post World War II. Remember, they had been invaded by the Japanese. So economically speaking, post World War II, China was a little bit slow to develop. It was because it was still under communistic control. Once we shifted away from communistic control, we see, especially into the 1990s, rapid economic development. So it's kind of flat post-World War II, and then I see a rapid increase as we become state capitalist. And as you can see on the map, they start to set up these special economic zones. So that's where other countries can set up their bases in China. 
that's exactly when we start to see outsourcing of our factories to other countries where environmental or um, uh, human benefits are not going to be a concern, right? So you can make things really cheaply, no worry about the environment or the labor. All right, so what happened in Japan in the transitional period? So, all right, so in 1853, Japan is forced to um, participate in the world economic system. They have to trade with the United States. They have to trade with other countries. And so remember, prior to that, they were a closed system. They had not had new weapons development or a lot of other new ideas, so they were a little behind. But after that, they experienced their first economic miracle. And remember when we talked about the little tigers last week? So these are the tigers. Um, Japan is one of them. Um, and in the first economic miracle, what happened? So because it was such a tight-knit society that had been really not really spending their money, especially the elites, they had a lot of money. And so in our first economic miracle, they mainly focused on the military. So they put a lot of their money into military development and they experienced a huge economic boom. So much so that that was what led to their invasion of most of their other Pacific neighbors. So remember, um, it was the United Pacific or Asia for Asians and they took over large swaths of the Pacific. And that's eventually what leads them to bombing Pearl Harbor. Well, we know what happened as a result of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. When the United States bombs Pearl Harbor, or excuse me, when Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, it propels the United States into World War II. And then we bomb Japan with our nuclear weapons. Um, after the end of World War II, we have a treaty with Japan, which forces them to have only a very small army for defense. They are not allowed to invest in military development. So they then take that money that they, you know, again, they are a close knit group. They were very good savers, you know, because they were working primarily within the family system. So they have the second economic miracle. So as it says on the slide, post World War II, they saw recovery of their economy within five years. So into, um, it's the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, we see a lot of investment in steel and technology. And at, in, by the 80s, Japan is the world leaders in steel production. Following right after that is Russia at that time, as well as technology. So we've all heard of Sony, um, and they put a lot of investment, of course, into like auto manufacture, things like that. So they were really leading the global economy. But unlike China, so if you can imagine China, if it's a graph, it's kind of flat in that time period of the 60s to the 90s, and then we see rapid growth, Japan drops and then increases pretty rapidly into obviously as it's you know post world war ii into the 50s and then is doing really well and then after about the 80s 90s it starts to stagnate and not really see development why well part of that has to do with population so we're going to go and talk about china again and then we'll come back to japan so china faced an issue of overpopulation we have seen, you know, improvement in the health of the individuals who are living in China. So, um, you know, whenever we have increased food production, you're going to see increase in population. As a result of that, China becomes very overpopulated and cultural parts uh, pay, plays a part in that because, you know, it was not encouraged to use birth control. So what does China do in response to that? And this is during the communistic period. They institute the one child policy. Really, it's not quite the one child policy. Um, what that actually says is, um, you know, if you were a urban dweller, you could only have one child. If you were a rural dweller, you could have up to two children. If you were one of their ethnic minorities, you could have up to three children. So obviously, previously, it could be uh, more than one child. And as you're seeing in this image, this was actually an image they had for family planning. 
Um, but what would happen is that if you had more than one child, you would be fined per child per year. So it was a huge economic expense to have more than one child. So they were really putting, you know, a crush on people to not have more than one child. They were also denied your government benefits. Because remember, this is a communistic state, so you would get benefits from the government. So if you had more than one child, you would not be getting those benefits. So as I said, urban families, one kid, rural families, two kids, three are the minorities could have. What did that lead to? A lack of females. Male dominated society. So this is patriarchal, just like most of our uh, countries in this region. So there was a preference for males. And one of the big reasons behind that is that the family would go and live with the son. So they wanted the son to take care of them when they were in their old age. So if you had a female child, it would often um, either had female infanticide, where they just leave the child to die, uh, or she would be get put in an orphanage. So as we approach kind of like the modern time period, there was actually a lack of women. So there was actually a big demographic shift. So if in nature you would have about 50 males to 50 females, Although usually I, I think in nature it's um, 51 females to 49 males, but you know, pretty close to even. What that led to is if you had 100 females, you'd have 129 males. So there was a big portion of the population that didn't have a marriage partner. So what they tried to do is basically entice women with, you know, offering them money or cars or an apartment. Um, or if you were in the rural area, it actually led to um, bride kidnap, where they would basically just kidnap women in order to marry them. Um, because there just simply wasn't enough women. And that actually might have been women who were already married, right? So they took them um, and they're like, I'm just going to marry you and <laughs> whatever if they um, like it or not, right? Um, in some poorer countries, they might also uh, buy the women. Right, because I, as I think I mentioned on the last slide, sometimes the families just simply didn't have enough money to support the family. So while they were not encouraging this practice, they would sell their females. So in Japan, they're encouraging population growth. So why are they doing that? That's because Japan is experiencing a graying. What do I mean by that? Well, that means that the population is rapidly becoming older. We actually see that in many first world, quote unquote, first world countries around the world. So let's look at the um, population pyramids here on the slide. So this is Japan in 1950. 1989 is in the middle. And then uh, 2040 is on the far right. So on our 1950 pyramid is a pretty classic population period with about 35% of the population being under 20 years old. The bulk of the population being in productive age where they're participating both economically as well as reproductively. So that's 15 to 64. And then our older population, a relatively small percentage, 4.9%. Comparing that to where they're predicting for 2040, so 61% of the population is under 14. Um, only 57, about 58% is productive age, but a very large population age 65 or older, 24%. So as it says on the slide, by 2025, so we're almost there, as many as one in four Japanese will be 65 or older. So what that means is just like we were talking about when we talked about um, Europe, that those people are typically not participating in the workforce, doesn't mean that they can't or won't, but you know, it's not necessarily encouraged or, or they're just not physically able to, and they will need care. And as we see an older population, we see diseases of aging, as I think we've discussed a little bit when we talked about Europe. So, you know, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, um, cancer more common. So it's expensive to um, help for their health care, as well as then again, just care for those parts of the population. And from a purely economic standpoint, what that means is you'll have a declining growth rate wrote declining growth rate in your economy because you have less of the economy uh, of the uh, population that is able to participate in the economy 
So what we're seeing then is um, predicted job vacancies. Now for a very long time, even post 1850, when they were forced to participate in the global system, Japan discouraged immigration. They did not want people coming from other parts of the world into their country. Whereas, you know, China has been pretty much okay with it. Um, and obviously we haven't seen those issues in United States. So migration definitely has a purpose when your natural rate of growth, remember those people who are being born, um, is low. What about religion in this area of the world? So in China and Korea, the dominant religion is Confucianism. So Confucianism is really actually a little bit more of a philosophy or a is spirituality versus like a set of rules. I mean, rules are involved, but it's not necessarily about God or the afterlife. It's about guiding who you are in this world, right? So for having good ethics, having good principles, guidance. And it has been hypothesized that Confucianism is what led to male preference because there's a big part of Confucianism that talks about the role of the male and how important that is and his role in guiding women and also the male taking care of his family after um, you know the parents reach older age so there's that idea that Confucianism might be contributing to our one child rule and that um, demographic imbalance that we see but the idea of Confucianism is that the philosophy promotes stability within the country we also see numerous quote unquote folk religions, or as I said before, um, localizing religions, which focus on ancestor worship. So we've discussed a little bit about ancestor worship before, but this is where we maybe pray to our ancestors to intervene in our daily lives, to help us provide good fortune, or simply just offering and recognizing that the ancestors are still there. So if you've ever seen Mulan, you actually get to experience that in the film because Mulan prays to her ancestors. Okay, so who are these individuals? These are the Miao, M-I-A-O, of China. They are one of those ethnic minorities that I mentioned in the previous slides. So these are one of the ones that would have been allowed to have three children because there's so few of them that they want to promote keeping that group alive. All right, so the Miao have a special way of practicing ancestor worship. So how do they do that? Notice the very unusual headpieces that the girls are wearing. And if you can notice in that lower image, behind the girl's head is a wooden piece that she will strap to her head. All right, so why are we wearing this? What does it all mean? Well, the Miao are water buffalo herders. As I said before, water buffalo are one of the main domesticated animals that you'll find in the East Asian area. So traditionally, the Miao have been water, water buffalo herders. So first, their headpiece is meant to symbolize that way of life. Their headpiece shape looks like the downturned horns of our water buffalo. What are these headpieces made of? Well, this is where ancestor worship comes into play. Our headpieces actually contain hair from their ancestors. So they will take pieces of hair that had once been on the head of their ancestors and wind it around their head. And there's also cotton in there, cotton batting that will fill that out. It's not all hair um, and make that structure as you see bound to their heads. And in certain times of the year, usually like a harvest time or like in the spring, they will perform these dances, these festivals, wearing the headpieces to celebrate their ancestors and to celebrate a successful year or helping to promote a successful year for the future. And unlike some other areas of the world where the elderly are not revered, they are highly revered in our East Asian system, right? Because again, they have ancestor worship. Those are the people that are gonna in intervene for you after they have passed on. So this is actually uh, Du Piyuna. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I'm sorry. Um, so she was the oldest Chinese person in 2002. She was 116 years old, as far as she knew. Um, I believe that from what I've read, she was not 100% sure of her birth date, 
but yeah, 116. So Islam is another uh, big religion, religion, especially in outer China. Um, so in Mongolia, right? So that part of Mongolia that is a little bit more habitable. Um, and there's a better shot of the yurt there, that nomadic tent structure. Again, this is um, a portable structure that they would live in and kind of move around freely. But most common in inner Mongolia, um, which makes sense. If you think about the position, it's close to Central Asia. So close to those areas where they would have had um, trade along the Silk Road that would have promoted Islam. And if you remember when we talked about the Middle East and also South Asia, those were stops along the Silk Road. The Mongolians, which were known as hoarders, um, would not uh, disrupt trade along the Silk Road. So they got those ideas of Islam along the Silk Road. And in Japan, there's a couple different practices, including Shintoism. So Shinto is known as the way. So it's really all about balance. So if you think about like feng shui or um, the, the idea of like the yin and the yang, so the good and the bad, nature versus um, the human world, it's all about balance. And they believe in the sacred powers of every part of nature. So nature worship is a part of that. Um, that they're going to value all of what they see in nature. It has a spirit, kind of like what we might have talked about more native religions that we see in the United States. Um, the other real religion in Japan is um, Buddhism. All right, so culture continued. What does that look like now? Well, in, Japan, in China, excuse me, when it was a communistic country, we had obviously gender issues. So let's move back actually before uh, it was communistic, talking about when it was an imperial system, which did extend into the uh, communistic period. But we had the practice of traditional Chinese foot binding. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Joy Luck Club, but they talk about that in the film, if you've never seen it. All right, so that's the image you're seeing in the upper right. So what happened with traditional Chinese foot binding? So in traditional Chinese foot binding, when the girl was young, she's about five or six, her mother would break the toes of her foot and bind her feet with special silk wrappings that were wet and had herbs, which was to help with the smell, honestly. And then she would bind her foot very tightly. And as her, the silk would dry, it would get tighter. Over time, what would happen is then the toes of the foot would be forced under, exactly as you're seeing in the image. So her foot would grow like that, right? And as I said, it was to cover the smell, um, the toes would necrolize. So I mean, they would fall off, they would rot off her foot. This was considered very beautiful. The beautiful, most beautiful was the golden lotus which was, I, I believe, a five inch foot. So as you might imagine, this was not a common practice amongst our peasants. So the practice of foot binding begins with the elite. The elite, of course, the women were considered ornamental. They were not necessarily having to work, you know, because they had servants. So now she could sit around and be decorative, right? So once you had your foot fully formed, as you can see, or deformed rather, she's basically hobbled. The woman could barely walk, so she would often have to have guidance around her home, so her um, relatives would help her walk around the house. This also meant that women were not participating in government, because if you can barely walk, you're not gonna be really getting out there and participating in government. You're gonna hang be hanging around the house looking really pretty, right? Again, this was amongst the um, elite class first. It eventually makes its way into the middle class. It never really makes its way into the lower class, the lowest class of farmers and other workers. You might imagine why that is the case. Those women had to work. If you were raising children or working on the farm, they don't have time for you to be hobbling around. They need you to work. So they really never participated in Chinese foot binding. That practice continues actually until World War II. So post-World War II, so they are a communistic period at that point. And as we talked about when we talked about 
Russia and the Soviet Union. In communism, we had a focus on gender neutrality. So rather than women being decorative or not participating in government or not participating, participating in the economic system, now women were expected to fully participate. So this is actually a propaganda poster that was from the Communist Party. And it shows, you know, women doing work just as men would do. So they saw a little bit more gender um, equality during the time of communist rule. Although, again, if you know much about that governmental system was not really necessarily the best for anybody. Um, and then we see another shift. So post-communist in, um, in China, we saw increasing sexualization of women. So rather than being a gender neutral or being very modest and more covered up, we have more sexualization. So you'll see women, um, especially when we saw, you know, um, US servicemen stationed in Japan and also in China. So more focus on sex work, both for um, the Chinese, especially in poverty, and then in Japan, which we're gonna talk about in just a second, uh, the geisha system. Um, and also, uh, you know, moving into like advertising, for example. So in the past, you would have never seen women in a sexualized position in the advertisements. But as we, especially again, it was sort of meant for really almost the US gaze because they started putting women in not necessarily hyper-sexualized positions, but definitely more than you would have seen post or uh, pre-World War II. And part of that was motivated by the fact that, you know, these women wanted to um, maybe shift to uh, moving into the United States, right? And that actually has happened a lot. A lot of people, again, just like we saw when we talked about like South Asia, where there was that brain drain, saw a lot of people coming from this area. Um, in Japan, uh, pretty similar, um, very focused on modesty in terms of um, how women were expected to behave. But we also saw the, the geisha system, right? And so what was the geisha system? What was that history like, right? Well, um, it started quite a while ago, really in the height of the uh, stratified society. So in like the 1800s, um, but where, so where we initially saw our geisha as men, believe it or not, they were males and it was mainly like in, for dances or performance, but by um, 17, 80s, they were females. But initially, you know, these were for the very wealthy, um, and obviously they were courtesans. So it meant to be a partner. So for all manners of pleasant things, you know, tea service and things of that nature, but, um, you know, also for sex. But over time, it became very popular. That continued up until the 1920s. But as it started into World War II, um, geisha kind of starts to decline. And that's again where we start to see that, um, I guess, sexualization of women in Japan as well. Because as we saw, you know, US service people stationed in Japan, and then in post war, World War II uh, occupation of Japan with, again, US soldiers there, uh, more focus on like sex work or like waitresses versus like what geisha would have been culturally prior to World War II. So they were more sexualized. And then let's talk a little bit about the modern age, right? So women are really just occupying a wide range of roles. So women are now able to work outside the home. A lot of women, especially in Japan, are choosing to not have children, not get married, but instead have a job which is also contributing to that graying of Japan because they're not having children. Because often, you know, culturally in Japan, if you were to get married, that meant you're gonna be in the home. You're gonna be taking care of the kids. You're not gonna have a job. So they just choose not to get married at all. China, um, we see more of a role for women in um, our factories. So just like we saw in Southeast Asia, so where we have service um, jobs or in industrial jobs, that's where women are working. And 
Kind of the same reason, why do we have women working in the factories? It's because they're easier to control under what the factory owners have had to say. And I've literally seen interviews where they said that. So it's not me just making that up. Um, and also um, they can pay them less, right? So that's, they'll actually maybe just have a few males employed there to help with the heavy lifting. And then um, they'll have mostly women doing the work. They also have smaller hands, a little bit easier to do some of the jobs. Um, so in terms of like modern Japanese society, uh, geisha still continues, but it's more of a, I guess you want to say like a tourist thing. So kind of what you might expect that when you would go to like Hawaii, where you're interacting with like hula dancers and it's sort of that commodification of culture again, you go and interact with a geisha as a cultural experience, not anywhere near where it was in the past, where it was this highly elite mainly aimed at the wealthy. And women might do things again that were traditionally for men. So the video I have for this is the Taipo um, drummers and it's women doing that. So definitely go to uh, Canvas to check that out. And lastly, talking about globalization, you know, again, we've talked about that before with United States, that we think of globalization as the westernization of the world and our Western influence over other cultures. And certainly we have done that in this area of the world. So one of the most popular areas for jeans, so like Levi's, is actually in Japan. They actually popularize Levi's and then, then it starts to grow in the United States. But we also have the quote unquote East meets West. So Eastern ideas coming to the United States. So let's talk about a few examples. Food is one of them. Looking in the upper right, that's a picture of General So's, So's chicken. And General So's chicken, as we know it in the United States, not a Chinese dish. <laughs> um, they do have spicy chicken. So peppers really popular like in the Sichuan province where this would come from. But what we experience is General So's chicken, which is sweeter and fried, not how they eat it in China which would be really spicy and not fried. So where that started was from Chinese immigrants to the United States. So when Chinese immigrants came here, this was again post-World War II, um, they weren't allowed to do very much. They had limited um, industries that they could enter. So that's why you also saw a lot of Chinese laundries because that was something they were allowed to do. But it was also restaurants. And so they start making traditional Chinese dishes, but you know, our American palate doesn't really like that. So they add a lot of sugar and they fried it and then it became really popular. So General So's chicken is a globalized dish that came from China. And then two that usually my students know way more about than me, um, anime and manga. So this is Attack on Titan and I just picked it as an example, but things like Hello Kitty, another one, um, I mean, you could, you guys probably know dozens of examples where I can only name a few, uh, you know, anime girls, <laughs> um, what's some of the popular ones? My Hero Academia. I know my son likes that one. Seven Deadly Sins is another one, but yeah, those become popular here. So our comics and, um, basically cartoons. And that actually starts in the 1980s. So with my generation watching the cartoons. And eventually then the comics also making their way here and just huge explosion in Japanese culture here in the United States. So like the Lolita movement and wearing those dresses and kawaii. So taking that idea from Japan of everything small and cute, which I love too. Um, so yeah, really that East meets West globalization. So it kind of runs counter to what we think about ideas from the United States influencing culture over everywhere else. But okay, that is East Asia. So go and watch those, just those couple short little videos on Canvas as well. So it's gonna be about the Great Wall of China and really cool typo drumming with females. And then you're ready to take the knowledge check on Canvas.